which camera are we supposed to look at? I'm looking at this one. This one. This one? So this, this top this one is just for me. This okay. is the one um, that will be for you, and then there's a couple more. <laughs> is my hair okay, or does it look funny? You have a hair looking up. No, it's you have to put it back. You can put it back. It was just that there was. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't ask because I'm a 57 o'clock. If you want to check, young ladies, if you want to check, you can check. No sound, right? Can you put that You have to remember to. Yes, this is what I was. I will try. And we are supposed to talk to the camera. Yeah. Keep the microphone away from the microphone. We are live. We are live in a jacuzzi, not with you. But the sound goes. But then don't forget to keep it down. Okay, the chat is sorry, they can talk freely. Am I right? Can they talk freely? without talking. <laughs>
Welcome to CERN. This is the second live production dedicated to the restart of the LHC. I'm here in the Atlas control room. I'm Dr. Clara Nellist, and I will be your host for this session. I'm here with Dr. Katrin Bernius and Dr. Lorette Ponce. Uh, this is the nerve center of the ATLAS experiment, and it's where physicists monitor the operation of the detector and the uh, data collected. ATLAS is one of four uh, experiments on the LHC, and uh, along with CMS, it discovered the Higgs boson in 2012. If you have any questions during our Facebook Live, please ask them in the comments below or with the hashtag WhatsAppLHC. So welcome, uh, Dr. Katrin Bernius. Uh, could you tell us a little about yourself, please? Thanks. Yes, so I'm an Atlas physicist now working as a research uh, software developer for Slack. I've been working on Atlas since the start of my PhD, um, which was about 10 years ago. Great, thanks. Um, so maybe can you tell us a bit more about the Atlas detector? Yes, so the Atlas detector is the largest particle detector at the LHC. It's 46 meters long, 25 meters in diameter, and it weighs about 7,000 tons. Located, it's located 100 meters below our feet, and it's made up of a series of ever larger concentric cylinders around the interaction point. It can be divided into four major parts, the inner detector, the calorimeters, the muon spectrometer, and the magnet systems. The ATLAS experiment is a collaboration involving 3,000 physicists from 187 institutions in 41 countries. Great, thank you very much. So here you can see uh, this is the muon uh, spectrometer, uh, which you're seeing in the footage in the video. So this, this detector is 100 meters below us. Uh, we're at the ATLAS control room, which is above ground and the detector is below us. So thank you very much. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Lorette Ponce. Um, you work on the LHC. Could you tell us a bit more about yourself? Yes, hello. I'm Lorette Ponce. I'm actually working into the operation group uh, since 10 years now, a bit more than 10 years. Uh, I had the chance to start this machine. The LHC is the largest machine in the world, and I'm used to run this machine, provide the collisions for the big detectors. Great, so you're an expert. Uh, could you tell us more about the LHC, please? Yes, sure. So the LHC is the largest uh, accelerator in the world. Uh, this is a machine which is sitting 100 meters under our feet, and uh, it's accelerating protons uh, to almost the speed of light and uh, provide collisions in the four big experiments that we have sitting around this 27 kilometers long machine. So indeed, the protons start their travel into a little bottle, uh, uh, hydrogen bottle, which is sitting uh, underground, and we are accelerating slowly the protons, injecting them through a long chain of accelerator between different um, injectors chain. Indeed, we are reusing all the old machines that were in, um, in operation at CERN, and they are used in order to provide, accelerate the protons uh, towards big detectors, especially in Atlas. Great, thank you. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about how the beams are prepared for collision within ATLAS? Yes, uh, so as I said, we, injected, we are injected from the um, a long chain of accelerators, and it is a process which takes about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Then we accelerate, and uh, just before, when we reach the maximum energy of the machine, then we are squeezing this, um, these uh, beams, so concentrating the protons in order to provide as much as possible, as much as possible collisions and to increase the, the really the luminosity, what we call the luminosity, so the, ra the collision rates into the detectors. Okay, thank you. And so from these collisions, uh, how do we identify the particles that are created? So the particle identification is in fact a very crucial aspect um, of the ATLAS experiment and for all the analysis we have. We have uh, beams of particles which are um, provided by the LHC and they actually collide, which we can see in this animation here, in the center of the ATLAS detector, making collision debris in the form of new particles which fly out from the center into all directions. We use different detectors to measure the different properties and the different particles. Properties can be the charge, the momentum, and the energy of these particles. Thank you very much. 
So if you've just joined us, we are live here in the Atlas Control Room at CERN. And if you have any questions about the topics we're discussing, then please add them in the comments below, and we'll get to them at the end of uh, uh, after the discussion session. So uh, currently, we're not running. Could you tell us uh, why not? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, we are in, during this period, we are in the winter shutdown. So the, this machine needs uh, thousands of components which have to work together in order to produce the highest rate of collisions that we can provide. And this needs uh, regular maintenance. Uh, this needs to be retuned at regular intervals. So b during the, 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 the operation, we are stopping basically every 10 weeks for about one week to retune the machine. And during the winter, we are stopping for, t for a bit more than 10, day, 10 weeks. And we are retuning, maintaining, doing the maintenance of all these components to be ready to restart very soon and uh, to provide again collisions. Great, thank you. And so this also allows Atlas an opportunity to um, do upgrades to the detector. Could you tell us more there? Ah, no, okay. So <laughs> uh, in particular, there was work uh, on the heaviest part of the detector. Um, this is known as the tile calorimeter. Um, it's located in the uh, most central region of the Atlas detector, and it's designed to measure hadrons. So in a moment, we're going to see an animation of the tile calorimeter. Uh, it's made up of almost 200 modules uh, of iron plates and plastic uh, scintillators that are sandwiched between each other. Uh, a scintillator, of these tiles that you can see in between the gray iron plates. Uh, we're going to zoom into one of them in a moment. And a scintillator is a material that radiates light when it's exposed uh, to a charged particle. So here we're going to zoom in and we're going to take one of these scintillator plates. So when, when the charged particle uh, travels through, we're going to see it coming in now. Um, so as it's passing through the scintillating material, uh, it releases photons, which are particles of light. And these are read out by the electronics of the tile calorimeter. And we have over 10,000 uh, readout channels for this subdetector. So uh, what we're going to see next is, uh, is how these were actually replaced and, um, and uh and the new um, electronic channels were installed because during the winter shutdown we had teams replacing hundreds of these channels. And as we know that the um, entire calorimeter system is way too heavy with 2.5 million kilograms to just remove it easily from the Atlas cavern, um, for this short shutdown the engineers actually had to crawl into the heart of the experiment in order to carry out their work. And this is what you're going to see here. And this is also the reason why some of this footage might be a little bit darker. So what you see here is that the engineers are removing and replacing the electronics. Um, and of course, making sure that each part that is new is immediately tested to ensure it works well and we're taking good data with it. These new electronics are much simpler and do not have any readout limitations. Um, in, the, in the present system, and they therefore improve the redundancy and also the reliability of the tile calorimeter. So you can see the um, engineers installing them here in this footage. Um, the readout electronic itself for each module are actually placed in so-called drawers, and they're called drawers because you can actually quite literally slide them in and back out again. And this makes it a lot easier for the engineers to access them. So this is uh, the engineer in this, um, in this video right now is working on, on one of these drawers now, and you can see this here. It's, it has been pulled out and is being tested then. Um, the tile calorimeter upgrade itself um, improves the flexibility of the data selection system, which is a quite important system amongst many others in the Atlas detector, which is known as the trigger. The trigger system itself decides which data are being recorded um, because we can't, in the end, record all of them. So as you can see in this footage, it's actually been a quite a challenge to replace all this, working in the dark in tiny spaces. So all of this work is planned out months in advance and then has to uh, take place in quite a short upgrade period that we have over the winter. So there were many other upgrade activities during the shutdown. Uh, in addition, uh, we have the small muon drift chambers. Now, muons are charged particles, and they are the heavier cousins of electrons. 
And when they are created in the proton-proton collisions, uh, they travel through our detector, which you can see now in this animation. Uh, they, through, they travel through most of our detector without stopping, but they get to the muon spectrometer. So this is why we need a special system. And what we have is uh, each muon chamber contains these small tubes filled with gas. And as a muon passes through the tubes, it leaves a trail of electrically charged ions which drift to the sides and the center of the tubes. Um, and by measuring how much time it takes for these ions to drift, it's possible to determine the position of the muon as it passes through. So the muon chamber is just on the outside of the detector. Uh, and now you'll see this section fit back into the rest of our detector. So the new chambers that were actually installed during the shutdown are actually an extension to the current Atlas muon spectrometer. And you can see here the footage of it. Um, the new chambers, they actually provide an order of magnitude higher rate capability, which means that they can process more data per second. And they were installed in detector regions where we actually previously didn't have any chambers that would fit. So here you can see um, the muon chambers being prepared to be lowered into the cavern. Um, this is necessary because we try to carry out as much work as possible above ground because time in the cavern during the shutdown, for example, as well as the space is quite limited. So this is actually, this video uh, took place in a, in a hall that's just behind where we're sitting right now. So we're outside the Atlas control room, but the Atlas detector is about 100 meters underground. So they have to lower it down, as Catherine said, uh, down towards the detector. So in this footage, you saw that the muon chambers were being prepared to be lowered into the cavern. And um, as uh, Clara said, it's uh, 100 meters underground. But once it's arrived at the cavern, this is not the final destination and the final place where it's going to be set. It's all a quite delicate um, operation because it will have to be brought along the bottom of the detector to the position where it's then carefully lifted and wheeled inside the detector. And this is what we're going to see next. So interestingly, this is how the original Atlas detector uh, was constructed. It was built in parts above ground, uh, and then each section was lowered in a very similar way down to the cavern, and then constructed within the cavern. So now it's being lifted, uh, lifted up and then wheeled inside, where we have the engineers waiting to then turn it vertically, um, such that it can fit into the small gap that was previously vacant. Um, the regular muon chambers which we use in the rest of the spectrometers, they wouldn't fit in this space, so this is a very newly designed small muon chamber that is just right for this spot. And the great thing about this is that these new muon chambers will also be used in the high luminosity LHC, which means because of the smaller design with the smaller diameter tubes, it allows them to react more quickly and to measure the position more quickly. And this is necessary because in the high luminosity LHC running, we have a way more intense um, environment, and we will now see them performing during the, during the upcoming run. Great, thank you very much. So we've seen just two of the upgrades that have taken place uh, over, the last, over the winter shutdown, but there have been many more within Atlas. Um, great, so if you've just joined us, uh, we're live at the Atlas Control Room at CERN. This is a Facebook Live uh, with CERN. So if you have any questions, please add them in the comments below, and we will get to them. We're looking forward to seeing your questions. But as I said, we're in the Atlas Control Room. So Katrin, this is somewhere you've spent quite a lot of time. Can you this tell us more true. about it? So the Atlas uh, Control Room, is, as Clara said earlier, is the nerve center of the Atlas detector. This is where we can monitor everything in the detector, and we can also control the detector with it. And this is done by Atlas physicists in the control room, um, the control room itself is broken into various zones. Each zone, as you can see here from the desk layout, is um, for monitoring a specific part of the detector, for example, the tracking detector, or the calorimeters, or the muon system. Once the LHC is up and running and um, providing data, um, we have a 24-7 shift crew with about eight to 10 people who monitor, um, who monitor the experiment. Great, thank you. And Lorette, there's also there's a separate control room for the LHC, correct? Yes, we have a, co a control room uh, a bit further uh, in the other side of the mirror. And uh, there, the, the control center is controlling indeed all the complex of accelerator that we have at CERN. So not only the experiments, but only the, all the machines which are providing the collisions. 
it's also working 24 hours a day, seven days, <laughs> all the time. And we, to, to operate the whole complex, there is, uh, during the period of operation, nine person on shift, two dedicated for the, the operation of the LAG. Okay. Thank you. Um, so as you can see from the shots of the control room behind us, it's not completely full. There's some activity, but we're currently shut down. Um, but that doesn't mean that everybody is on holiday. Uh, Atlas physicists are continuing, continually uh, releasing new studies of the standard model as well as uh, searches for new physics. This is true because since discovering the Higgs boson in 2012, Atlas has been trying to understand whether this new particle is actually the Higgs boson as predicted by the standard model or if it's from a more exotic model. And one of the ways we can do this is by looking at extremely rare processes. For example, a Higgs boson decaying into two muons. We know that only 0.02% of the Higgs bosons that are produced in the Atlas experiment would actually decay into two muons according to the standard model. By collecting more data, this should allow the Atlas experiment to discover this rare decay process if the standard model is correct. But if, of course, the measured rates are found to be significantly different from the standard model, then this may provide a glimpse into new physics. So are we only looking for new physics? No, <laughs> no, we're not just looking at, uh, at new physics or searching for new physics, but we're also looking and studying other standard model particles and their properties, such as, for example, the W boson. Um, an example here is that La Atlas uh, released the first measurement of the W boson mass um, last year, which uh, matches the best single experiment measurement of the W mass, which has been performed by the CDF collaboration at the Tevatron Collider. And uh, with, with gaining more data, with the next few years of collecting more data with ATLAS, um, we will be able to make more precise measurements of standard model properties, but also search for these rare processes we um, mentioned earlier. And this is, of course, also necessary because there is a lot more to understand um, because the standard model, this is the theory of the, of the universe of the particles we have at the moment only describes 4% of, um, of the known universe. Um, so we have a lot of more questions to answer. For example, why is gravity so weak? Um, what is the nature of dark matter and dark energy? And why is there more matter than antimatter? Okay, thank you. So Atlas is continuing to search for answers uh, to these questions. And while we've yet to find evidence of new physics, every new result provides critical input for our theoretical models and has greatly improved our understanding of the standard model. We can look forward to more results in the coming months uh, from the data we've already collected. And what's more, with the LHC continuing its excellent performance uh, in 2017, Atlas can expect even greater sensitivity in future results. So thank you uh, for this discussion uh, part of the session. Uh, if you've just joined us, we are in the Atlas uh, control room and we're live at CERN. And now we're going to move on to the, the question and answer part of the session. So hopefully there have been some, uh, lots of questions uh, in the Facebook chat. And uh, first we're going to start with, when will the LHC be starting up again? And this is from Linda on Facebook. So we are finishing the, the recommission, what we call the recommissioning after the winter shutdown, and we hope to have the first beam again in circulating into the LHG the 1st of May. So in a bit less than two weeks from now. <laughs> Great, thank you. So the next question is, how do you control the magnetic field created by the magnets? So this is from uh, Shivan on Facebook. So indeed what we control is the, 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 the current which is put into the magnets and there is a careful calibration curve. So what we control at the milliamps level is the current that we are injecting into the magnet. Mm -hmm. And over the 27 kilometers, we are making sure that this is the whole path which is uh, into the all the, the, the magnets there. Okay. We also have another question from Eric. Um, what is a terra electron tron volt? So what is a TEV? Do you want to <laughs> answer that maybe? <laughs> Uh, so this is a measurement of the energy of the beam. Um, so a tera electron volt is uh, 10 with nine zeros after it. So, uh, and an electron volt is the, the measurement. Yeah, it's the energy that you need to accelerate one electron over one meter, <laughs> to be precise. And the tera electron volt is what you need to accelerate 
the a proton <laughs> from zero to almost the speed of flight. So we, are, we need the tera in front of the electron volt to express the energy that is in the magnet. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question we have is from uh, Louis, Louis on uh, Facebook. And uh, do you have more evidence about Higgs boson? Um, so the evidence we have is the discovery we've made. And what we're doing currently is in, in various physics analysis, we look for other ways the Higgs is going to be produced or decay and study with that the properties of the Higgs such that we can determine what kind of Higgs it is. Great, thank you. So our next question, uh, what is luminosity? So I think this is one for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is for me. So the luminosity is uh, the, the, the units that we are using to express the number of collisions that we are producing into the, into the intersection inter section region, so where we have the, the, the four experiments. So this is equivalent to the collision rate uh, that we have. So it's expressed in uh, inverse femtobarn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's uh, an, uh, another unit that we, we use to it, but it's basically proportional to the, to the number of protons colliding into the experiment. Okay, thank you. And uh, the next one links quite well. It's, uh, does the LHC only accelerate protons? This is from Tom on Facebook. No, we also accelerate ions. And indeed, we were the first to accelerate and to make collisions between ions and protons at very high energy also, so 6.5 TeV. And we do accelerate ions, uh, lead ions. And uh, we have also the possibility to accelerate later uh, other kind of ions. But for the time being, we just accelerate uh, lead ions. Okay, thank you. So the, the next question is from Martin on Facebook, and he asks, what's the most exciting find possible at CERN this year for you? So Catherine, what do you think? So it, it is quite, uh, that's an interesting <laughs> question. So um, yeah, so uh, I think the most interesting or exciting find this year would be finding some new physics, but we know that this is not not easy because we have to carefully analyze the data and we have to have enough data to be sure that we discovered something new. So anything that is to do with new physics that we have to think about that isn't explainable with a standard model would be already very exciting, I think. Great. So the next question, I think maybe we can each answer it in turn. <laughs> uh, the question is, what is it like to be a successful woman in physics at CERN? And it's from Hannah. So Lorette, do you want to start? <laughs> it's a difficult question. <laughs> Why to be, to be, well. I, I think as, as a, a professional physicist, that means you are a successful physicist. Um, <laughs> I know that we are surrounded by many physicists, so we have a large uh, group. So uh, I think people can be very modest, but what's it like to be a successful physicist? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, uh, well, I mean, talking about myself, uh, I've, been, I've been having seen the LHC starting and being there when, when the first time we inject into this machine, accelerate and provide the first time the collision. Of course, this is very uh, great. <laughs> I don't know how to say that, but uh, yeah, this is an opportunity that I think as a, as a young uh, physicist, uh, especially in the domain of operation of an accelerator, this is an opportunity that is, uh, is amazing. Yeah, that, uh, to be there just the first time we were injecting into this machine. Would you like to add anything? <laughs> I, I don't think there's much more to add, except that obviously for me, it wouldn't be the accelerator. It would be <laughs> part of being Atlas, but uh, it's alone working together with a lot of great other women, but also men who we have quite a few as well, and just generally working in a great team of people who are very excited about the work we're doing, very dedicated. It's just a really great atmosphere. Great, thank you. So the next question is, how about dark matter? I think you mentioned that very briefly. Uh, is CERN looking for that? So um, CERN is looking for dark matter in various analyses. Um, maybe, I don't know if you want to add more details to dark matter um, in which... Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're looking for, for dark matter and we don't... Uh, we know that dark matter exists and we know that it, um, it has mass out in the the universe, but we don't know how it will look if it's a particle in our detector. So we look for many different uh, ways in which it could present itself uh, in, in collisions within Atlas. Um, so one possible uh, theory is supersymmetry, and we have uh, many teams looking uh, for evidence of supersymmetric particles. 
um, but so far we, we haven't found any yet, but we keep looking. <laughs> so I guess that's uh, also the next question from Lars. Ah. Is supersymmetry still possible? It, it definitely <laughs> is still possible, <laughs> and uh, it has many supporters within CERN uh, who are looking for supersymmetry, but until we find uh, evidence, then we can't say uh, either way whether or not it exists. So the, the next question we have is, uh, why doesn't uh, the LHC operate all year? Ah, because uh, we indeed we we need to to do some maintenance on the on the machine and the machine is uh, is um, superconducting so it's a cold machine so any any maintenance action that we have to do takes time so we have to stop for at least one month to do the b the heavy maintenance and the, the and then we choose the winter time to do that and then we will restart as soon as all these maintenance are finished. And I think it's a good opportunity also for Atlas and the other experiments to, to perform these upgrades as well. Um, so it all fits in very nicely together. So we have another question, which is, would it be possible to discover a new unknown particle in this experiment? And would you recognize it as being as yet unknown? And this is from Shannon. This is a tough question. <laughs> so um, we can discover new particles, um, whether they're unknown, completely unknown, this depends on the search you're carrying out. There are various approaches. You can search for something you think that might be there, but you can also make more, um, more uh, general searches scanning certain areas of, of for example, masses or, or, or momentum um, of particles to see if there is something that doesn't quite fit, that doesn't quite agree with what we know so far. So I think it is possible, but obviously if it's unknown, we need to find a way of finding out what it is. We also have ways of finding particles that uh, might not present themselves like matter does in our detectors. So one way that we're doing this is that we could look for um, a particle that has traveled a certain distance before changing into standard model particles. And this would show itself as um, a, a vertex is when the particles uh, decay into new particles, and so this would present itself as a vertex later on in the detector. And so one of our previous upgrades in a previous um, shutdown period uh, was an upgrade to the tracking detector, and this helps with this kind of uh, analysis. So in that case, we would, we would see that there was a new particle, but we wouldn't yet know uh, what it was. So the, the next question we have is, is the beam visible? And this is from Christoph. <laughs> yes. Indeed, the beam is visible, uh, so maybe not at the sense that you understand with visible, but we do have means to see the beam. And as in the big detectors, what we do see in indeed is traces of these protons which are circulating into the machine. Uh, for the, in the case of the, uh, of the LHC, uh, the protons are so energetic that they are, uh, when they are curved along the path in the magnet, they are producing light, what we call the synchrotron light, and this is produced into the visible spectrum. So we do have ray cameras which can, can register, and we do have spots on screens which show where is the beam and how big is the beam. Great, thank you. So the next question we have is, uh, when will you be expanding the accelerator? So I think this is asking about possible future upgrades. Ah, future upgrades. <laughs> so the next step for the LHC is to slowly increase, first to increase the uh, bit the energy. So we are actually running at 6.5 TeV, and we could, we hope to go to be able to go to 7 TeV. So a little step, but which al is already an upgrade. And the next big step is the high luminosity LHC, which will arrive uh, in a few years now, f five years now uh, from from now. Uh, this, will be, this will be the next big step. Great, thanks. So the next question is from Jeff. And Jeff wants to know, can you explain the rubber duck behind you? So I I'm not sure. <laughs> I had to laugh at that question <laughs> when I saw it coming up. So if so you, you can, can see, see where my um, finger is, yeah. there's actually a rubber duck just here. <laughs> and uh, so this is a very important uh, part of the control room. And what it does is if you have a problem with your code, uh, then the rubber duck is there to be the first thing that you explain your problem to. <laughs> because usually when you have a problem, uh, discussing it out loud allows you to solve it yourself. Um, so <laughs> it's called the DAC duck, and it's, it's uh, something that the shifters can talk to late at night. <laughs> Another explanation would be that DAC actually is the um, acronym for the data acquisition system, which sounds like duck, and then physicists came up in probably late hours with um, having a rubber duck sitting there, <laughs> keeping them company. Um, so our next question is, uh, what is the total percent of collisions actually recorded? Um, 
I guess mm -hmm. that's a question for the... <laughs> uh, that would be more a question <laughs> for the computer center specialist. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I think it's a few percent only of the, co the total collisions that we, are d we do record. There is already a pre-filtering at the level of the, the first trigger after the detectors, and only on a few percent are at the end registered into the computer center, but uh, I think it's more a question for really computer scientists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> from, from our end, we can say we, we actually have collisions at this design numbers at 40 megahertz, which we need to reduce to one kilohertz, which a, a hertz is one over a second. So that's a, a quite large reduction factor we have to apply just to be able to write it out and read it and, and record it. But then, of course, we do apply other selection cuts for, for example, analyses. But obviously, that's not the question for it being recorded. <laughs> Um, so the next question we have is, what is your aim for this year? And this is from Pranjal and from Louis. Um, so maybe I go first. Yeah. Um, so I'm starting a, a new position with a new university. So I'm going to be moving on to a slightly different uh, analysis. And my aim is to be able to uh, hopefully find evidence of uh, top quarks changing into Higgs bosons, uh, which is something that is theorized, but we don't have enough data yet to, uh, to state. Uh, with data. <laughs> yeah, so my, my personal aim is to I've st started a new position at the end of last year, so I'm going to be working, or I'm already working on the trigger software, so I'll be uh, working more on this and, and trying to also start working for the upgrade of, of the LHC, which we're starting already to work on. But um, if you want to know the aim for maybe for the Atlas experiment, and this is obviously to collect way more good data um, which we can add to the data sets we collected in the last few years and then um, analyze it and hopefully get some interesting results out. And Lorette, would you like to say your aim for the year? <laughs> <laughs> the aim from the machine's point of view is to produce as much as possible collisions and we have a target that we hope that we will be able to produce as at least as much collision as last year, but uh, we hope to also uh, give a bit more in order to, to, to give the proper the possibility for the big experiments to, to improve their data. Great, thank you. So we have a question that says, um, we talked a lot about muons. So why are muons important for Atlas? So muons uh, generally are quite important because they provide very clean um, tracks in the Atlas detector. We have, um, if we have particles decaying to muons, then we can detect these muons in the muon spectrometer, which is the outermost layer of the Atlas detector, um, which means that all the other particles, like electrons, they won't reach this part because they have been stopped by the calorimeters to measure their energy already. So in fact, one of the things um, we did with muons was to discover the Higgs boson um, in, a, in, a, in a certain decay channel where the Higgs decays to two Z bosons, which then decay to four muons. And that was a very clean signal to find. Not easy, but easier than the others. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing again the animation from the muon spectrometer, and this is a, a muon particle passing through uh, the drift tubes. And I think, as we said before, this is a very clean signature. Exactly. So it's a really nice, uh, nice way to look for uh, new particles. Um, so our next question uh, is, can people visit CERN? And the answer is definitely yes. Please come and visit us. So this is from Pavadi uh, on Facebook. And uh, you, can, you can visit our webpage and uh, find out about visits. But we really encourage people to come. Uh, you can come and stand here, and you can look through the glass at the, the physicist. You can go and visit the other control rooms and, and yep. find out more about what's happening here at CERN. You can find out about the visits if you visit the CERN.ch webpage and uh, read up for how you can come here and what you get to see. Um, so we have another question, which is, why are there so many different accelerators at CERN? This is from Anna on Facebook. So the whole chain of accelerator is, is indeed used to accelerate the protons uh, towards the LHC. Each accelerator is indeed a old machine, and we are reusing the older machine in order to produce the beam for the next machine. We cannot accelerate directly from the bottle till the 6.5 TeV. We need to go in steps. And each accelerator has, it, has its own um, uh, detectors and physics programs attached to it. Uh, to be more precise, uh, the, the booster and the PS, so the first two machines, are really used to produce, to, to already give the, the number, the intensity, so the intensity of the, of the 
bunches that we are injecting into the LHC, all the characteristics, the number of potents, the size of the, uh, of the bunches are already uh, set up by the, by the booster and the PS, and then the SPS is used to accelerate, pre-accelerate, and then we inject into the LHC and accelerate again to go to the nominal top energy, which is 6.5 TeV. Great, thank you. And so another question which links is, uh, why is the LHC below ground? And this is from Betty on Facebook. <laughs> It's a practical reason, <laughs> two, two, two good reasons. The first one is it's a ring of 27 kilometers. So having a 27 kilometer machine uh, set somewhere between the Jura and the uh, uh, Geneva Lake would be difficult on the surface. So for practical reasons, it is underground. And on top of that, the ground itself is providing a shielding towards the beam itself. And then it's why it's under metal. Why it is so deep into uh, under our feet, it's also to be in a stable layer of ge geologically layer so this is uh, the, the best position as under about 100 meters, not too deep, but deep enough to be stable from the geological point of view. Thank you. And then also for the atlas detector, uh, as we talked a lot about muons, these are particles that can travel. They, they come from cosmic rays, um, and they can travel through the ground. And uh, actually, it's good for the atlas detector to be so deep because this helps to shield somewhat from the, the muons coming from the cosmic rays. So here you can see uh, a time lapse of the moving uh, one of the muon chambers within atlas. Um, so it has to be very big to, to measure the muons coming from the collisions from the, the protons, but we want it to be very deep underground to protect as much as possible from uh, the cosmic rays. So we have another question now, which is how do you create the proton beam inside of the LHC? And this is from Frank. So the proton beams are not really produced inside the LHC. They are produced from a hydrogen bottle. So we are just uh, by a simple electrolyse uh, extracting uh, the protons from, uh, from the hydrogen atom applying an electric, uh, an electric field, and then they are then injected directly into the LHC and accelerated only into the LHC. So we are not, strictly speaking, producing the beam into the LHC, <laughs> but from, from a hydrogen bottle. Uh, so I have a follow-up question. How long can protons last within the LHC? Ah, as long as they are not colliding forever. <laughs> the main problem for the protons is really the collision. <laughs> but uh, to, okay, to give numbers, uh, when we are producing collisions, so when we are in sta what we call stable conditions to produce collision for the physics, we can keep the beam for typically 15 hours. So during 15 hours, we are providing collisions. Then we, the, the intensity left into the machine because we are burning off some protons during the collisions is low enough so that it makes sense to, to just dump the beam, extract it from the LHC, and start again another cycle. So typically, we have production period for, for really uh, collisions of 15 hours, 20 hours. We have a record of uh, almost 40 hours. <laughs> but OK, this was because there was some injectors problem, so we kept it. And we can really keep it as long as there's no other problem which prevent to, to keep it longer. Thank you. Um, so we have another question, which is, is a circular collider more efficient than a linear collider? And that's from Shuria. I'm very sorry if I said that wrong. But it depends what you want to do. Uh, in, in, to keep the, to accelerate uh, really to high energy, a circular collider is easier because you can accelerate, you accelerate a bit at each turn and you keep every turn. The acceleration into the LHC takes 20 minutes. So we are ramping up slowly the magnets and all the acceleration. In a linear collider, you have to, to give a, a really big kick every step. Otherwise, you need a very long uh, accelerator. So depending of what kind of particle you accelerate and what is the strength you can give at each acceleration, you choose either a circular collider or a linear collider. OK, thank you. So sadly, this is our last question of the session. Um, so the question is, what does CERN know about dark matter and antimatter so far? So I think the first question is very simple. The, the first part of the question is, we don't know anything about dark matter. Uh, we're still trying to find out more about it, but at the moment, it's still uh, a mystery. <laughs> uh, and so antimatter, we're, we're learning quite a lot about antimatter, and that's uh, one of our uh, one of the other experiments on the LHC. LHCb is making many studies uh, about antimatter. Um, but we still we don't have solid evidence so far about why matter and antimatter uh, why there's more matter uh, than antimatter in the universe. So we just have to continue studying and yeah. getting more data. <laughs> uh, okay, so thank you very much. Um,
those are, that's all we have time for for questions. Um, if there are any other questions left in the comments, then we'll try and get some physicists to come and uh, answer some of the questions uh, down below. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us uh, on this Atlas uh, Control Room uh, CERN Facebook Live event, and um, hopefully see you for the next one. So thank you very much. Uh, I should say thank you to our guests, uh, Dr. Katrin Bernius and uh, Dr. Loretta Ponce. And, uh, Thanks a lot for having us, Clara. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.